Moby Dick, or, The Whale, by Herman Melville. Chapter 33. The Speck Snyder. Concerning the officers of the whale craft, this seems as good a place as any to set down a little domestic peculiarity on shipboard, arising from the existence of the harpooner class of officers, a class unknown of course in any other marine than the whale fleet. The large importance attached to the harpooner's vocation is evinced by the fact, that originally in, the old Dutch fishery, two centuries and more ago, the command of a whale ship was not wholly lodged in the person now called the captain, but was divided between him and an officer called the Speck Snyder. Literally this word means fat cutter, usage, however, in time made it equivalent to chief harpooner. In those days, the captain's authority was restricted to the navigation and general, management of the vessel, while over the whale hunting department and all its concerns, the Speck Snyder or chief harpooner reigned supreme. In the British Greenland fishery, under the corrupted title of Spegineer, this old Dutch official is still retained, but his former dignity is sadly abridged. At present he ranks simply as senior harpooner, and as such, is but one of the captain's more, inferior subalterns. Nevertheless, as upon the good conduct of the harpooners the success of the whaling voyage largely depends, and since in the American fishery he is not only an important officer in the boat, but under certain circumstances, night watches on a whaling ground, the command of the ship's deck is also his, therefore the grand political maxim of the sea demands, that he should, nominally live apart from the men before the mast, and be in some way distinguished as their professional superior, though always, by them, familiarly regarded as their social equal. Now, the grand distinction drawn between officer and man at sea, is this the first lives aft, the last forward. Hence, in whale ships and merchantmen alike, the mates have their quarters with the captain, and so, too, in most of the American whalers the harpooners are lodged in the after part of the ship. That is to say, they take their meals in the captain's cabin, and sleep in a place indirectly communicating with it. Though the long period of a southern whaling voyage, by far the longest of all voyages now or ever made by man, the peculiar perils of it and the community of interest prevailing among a, company, all of whom, high or low, depend for their profits, not upon fixed wages, but upon their common luck, together with their common vigilance, intrepidity, and hard work, though all these things do in some cases tend to beget a less rigorous discipline than in merchantmen generally, yet, never mind how much like an old Mesopotamian family these whalemen may, in some primitive instances, live, together, for all that, the punctilious externals, at least, of the quarter deck are seldom materially relaxed, and in no instance done away. Indeed, many are the Nantucket ships in which you will see the skipper parading his quarter deck with an elated grandeur not surpassed in any military navy, nay, extorting almost as much outward homage as if he wore the imperial purple, and not the shabbiest, of pilot cloth. And though of all men the moody captain of the Pequod was the least given to that sort of shallowest assumption, and though the only homage he ever exacted, was implicit, instantaneous obedience, though he required no man to remove the shoes from his feet ere stepping upon the quarter deck, and though there were times when, owing to peculiar circumstances connected with events, hereafter to be detailed, he addressed them in unusual terms, whether of condescension or in terrorum, or otherwise, Yet even Captain Ahab was by no means unobservant of the paramount forms and usages of the sea. Nor, perhaps, will it fail to be eventually perceived, that behind those forms and usages, as it were, he sometimes masked himself, incidentally making use of them for other and more, private ends than they were legitimately intended to subserve. That certain sultanism of his brain, which had otherwise in a good degree remained unmanifested, through those forms that same sultanism became incarnate in an irresistible dictatorship. For be a man's intellectual superiority what it will, it can never assume the practical, available supremacy over other men, without the aid of some, sort of external arts and entrenchments, always, in themselves, more or less paltry and base. This it is, that forever keeps God's true princes of the empire from the world's hustings, and leaves the highest honors that this heir can give, 
to those men who become famous more through their infinite inferiority to the choice hidden handful of the divine inert, than through their undoubted, superiority over the dead level of the mass. Such large virtue lurks in these small things when extreme political superstitions invest them, that in some royal instances even to idiot imbecility they have imparted potency. But when, as in the case of Nicholas the Tsar, the ring crown of geographical empire encircles an imperial brain, then, the plebeian herds crouch abased before the tremendous, centralization. Nor, will the tragic dramatist who would depict mortal indomitableness in its fullest sweep and direct swing, ever forget a hint, incidentally so important in his art, as the one now alluded to. But Ahab, my captain, still moves before me in all his Nantucket grimness and shagginess, and in this episode touching emperors and kings, I must not conceal that I have only to do with a poor old whale hunter like him, and, therefore, all outward majestical trappings and housings are denied me. Oh, Ahab! What shall be grand in thee, it must needs be plucked at from the skies, and dive for in the deep, and featured in the unbodied Erex. Chapter 34. The Cabin Table. It is noon, and oh boy, the steward, thrusting his pale loaf of bread face from the cabin scuttle, announces dinner to his lord and master, who, sitting in the leak water boat, has just been taking an observation of the sun, and is now mutely reckoning the latitude on the smooth, medallion-shaped tablet, reserved for that daily purpose on the upper part of his ivory, leg. From his complete inattention to the tidings, you would think that Moody Ahab had not heard his menial. But presently, catching hold of the mizen shrouds, he swings himself to the deck, and in an even, unexhilarated voice, saying, Dinner, Mr. Starbuck, disappears into the cabin. When the last echo of his sultan's step has died away, and Starbuck, the first to mirror, has every reason to suppose, that he is seated, then Starbuck rouses from his quietude, takes a few turns along the planks, and, after a grave peep into the binnacle, says, with some touch of pleasantness, dinner, Mr. Stubb, and descends the scuttle. The second Amir lounges about the rigging a while, and then slightly shaking the main brace, to see whether it will be all right with that important rope, he likewise takes up, the old burden, and with a rapid dinner, Mr. Flask, follows after his predecessors. But the third Amir, now seeing himself all alone on the quarter deck, seems to feel relieved from some curious restraint, for, tipping all sorts of knowing winks in all sorts of directions, and kicking off his shoes, he strikes into a sharp but noiseless squall of a hornpipe right over the Grand Turk's head, and, then, by a dexterous slight, pitching his cap up into the mizen top for a shelf, he goes down rollicking so far at least as he remains visible from the deck reversing all other processions, by bringing up the rear with music. But ere stepping into the cabin doorway below, he pauses, ships a new face altogether, and, then, independent, hilarious little flask enters King Ahab's presence, in the, character of Abjectos, or the slave. It is not the least among the strange things bred by the intense artificialness of sea usages, that while in the open air of the deck some officers will, upon provocation, bear themselves boldly and defyingly enough towards their commander, yet, ten to one, let those very officers the next moment go down to their customary dinner in that same commander's cabin, and straightway their inoffensive, not to say deprecatory and humble air towards him, as he sits at the head of the table, this is marvelous, sometimes most comical. Wherefore this difference? A problem? Perhaps not. To have been Belshazzar, King of Babylon, and to have been Belshazzar, not haughtily but courteously, therein certainly must have been some touch of mundane grandeur. But he who in, the rightly regal and intelligent spirit presides over his own private dinner table of invited guests, that man's unchallenged power and dominion of individual influence for the time, that man's royalty of state transcends Belshazzar's, for Belshazzar was not the greatest. Who has but once dined his friends? has tasted what it is to be Caesar. It is a witchery of social czarship which there is no, withstanding. Now, if to this consideration you superadd the official supremacy of a shipmaster, then, 
by inference, you will derive the cause of that peculiarity of sea life just mentioned. Over his ivory inlaid table, Ahab presided like a mute, main sea lion on the white coral beach, surrounded by his warlike but still deferential cubs. In his own proper turn, each officer waited to be served, they were as little children before Ahab, and yet, in Ahab, there seemed not to lurk the smallest social arrogance. With one mind, their intent eyes all fastened upon the old man's knife, as he carved the chief dish before him. I do not suppose that for the world they would have profaned that moment with the slightest observation, even upon so neutral a topic as the weather. No. And when reaching, out his knife and fork, between which the slice of beef was locked, Ahab thereby motioned Starbuck's plate towards him, the maid received his meat as though receiving alms, and cut it tenderly, and a little started if, perchance, the knife grazed against the plate, and chewed it noiselessly, and swallowed it, not without circumspection. For, like the coronation banquet at Frankfurt, where the, German emperor profoundly dines with the seven imperial electors, so these cabin meals were somehow solemn meals, eaten in awful silence, and yet at table old Ahab forbade not conversation, only he himself was dumb. What a relief it was to choking stub, when a rat made a sudden racket in the hold below. And poor little flask, he was the youngest son, and little boy of this weary family party. His, were the shin bones of the Saldean beef, his would have been the drumsticks. For flask to have presumed to help himself, this must have seemed to him tantamount to larceny in the first degree. Had he helped himself at that table, doubtless, never more would he have been able to hold his head up in this honest world, nevertheless, strange to say, Ahab never forbade him. And had Flask helped himself, the chances were Ahab had never so much as noticed it. Least of all, did Flask presume to help himself to butter. Whether he thought the owners of the ship denied it to him, on account of its clotting his clear, sunny complexion, or whether he deemed that, on so long a voyage in such markless waters, butter was at a premium, and therefore was not for him, a subaltern, however it was, Flask. Alas! Was a butterless man. Another thing. Flask was the last person down at the dinner, and Flask is the first man up. Consider. For hereby Flask's dinner was badly jammed in point of time. Starbuck and Stubb both had the start of him, and yet they also have the privilege of lounging in the rear. If Stubb even, who is but a peg higher than Flask, happens to have but a small appetite, and soon, shows symptoms of concluding his repast, then Flask must bestir himself, he will not get more than three mouthfuls that day, for it is against holy usage for Stubb to precede Flask to the deck. Therefore it was that Flask once admitted in private that ever since he had arisen to the dignity of an officer, from that moment he had never known what it was to be otherwise than hungry, more or less, for what he ate did not so much relieve his hunger, as keep it immortal in him. Peace and satisfaction, thought Flask, have forever departed from my stomach. I am an officer, but, how I wish I could fish a bit of old-fashioned beef in the forecastle, as I used to when I was before the mast. There's the fruits of promotion now. There's the vanity of glory, there's the insanity of life. Besides, if, it were so that any mere sailor of the Pequod had a grudge against Flask and Flask's official capacity, all that sailors had to do, in order to obtain ample vengeance, was to go aft at dinner time, and get a peep at Flask through the cabin skylight, sitting silly and dumbfoundered before awful Ahab. Now, Ahab and his three mates formed what may be called the first table in the Pequod's cabin. After, their departure, taking place in inverted order to their arrival, the canvas cloth was cleared, or rather was restored to some hurried order by the pallid steward. And then the three harpooners were bidden to the feast, they being its residuary legatees. They made a sort of temporary servant's hall of the high and mighty cabin. In strange contrast to the hardly tolerable constraint and nameless, invisible domineerings of the captain's table, was the entire carefree license and ease the almost frantic democracy of those inferior fellows the harpooners. While their masters, the mates, seemed afraid of the sound of the hinges of their own jaws, the harpooners chewed their food with such a relish that there was a report to it. They dined like lords, they filled their bellies like Indian, 
ships all day loading with spices. Such portentous appetites had Guigig and Tashko, that to fill out the vacancies made by the previous repast, often the pale dough boy was faint to bring on a great barren of salt junk, seemingly quarried out of the solid ox. And if he were not lively about it, if he did not go with a nimble hop skip and jump, then Tashko had an ungentlemanly way of, accelerating him by darting a fork at his back, harpoon-wise. And once Dagu, seized with a sudden humor, assisted Doughboy's memory by snatching him up bodily, and thrusting his head into a great empty wooden trencher, while Tashko, knife in hand, began laying out the circle preliminary to scalping him. He was naturally a very nervous, shuddering sort of little fellow, this bread-faced, steward the progeny of a bankrupt baker and a hospital nurse. And what with the standing spectacle of the black terrific Ahab, and the periodical tumultuous visitations of these three savages, Doughboy's whole life was one continual lip quiver. Commonly, after seeing the harpooners furnished with all things they demanded, he would escape from their clutches into his little pantry adjoining, and, fearfully peep out at them through the blinds of its door, till all was over. It was a sight to see Queek exceeded over against Tashko, opposing his filed teeth to the Indians, crosswise to them, Dagu seated on the floor, for a bench would have brought his hearse-bloomed head to the low carlines, at every motion of his colossal limbs, making the low cabin framework to shake, as when an African elephant goes passenger in a ship. But for all this, the great negro was wonderfully abstemious, not to say dainty. It seemed hardly possible that by such comparatively small mouthfuls he could keep up the vitality diffused through so broad, baronial, and superb a person, but, doubtless, this noble savage fed strong and drank deep of the abounding element of air, and through his dilated nostrils snuffed in the sublime life of the worlds. Not by beef or by bread, are giants made or nourished. But Gwigig, he had a mortal, barbaric smack of the lip in eating an ugly sound enough, so much so, that the trembling doughboy almost looked to see whether any marks of teeth, lurked in his own lean arms. And when he would hear Tashko singing out for him to produce himself, that his bones might be picked, the simple-witted steward all but shattered the crockery hanging round him in the pantry, by his sudden fits of the palsy. Nor did the whetstone which the harpooners carried in their pockets, for their lances and other weapons, and with which whetstones. At dinner, they would ostentatiously sharpen their knives, that grating sound did not at all tend to tranquilize poor Doughboy. How could he forget that in his island days, Gwigig, for one, must certainly have been guilty of some murderous, convivial indiscretions. Alas! Doughboy! Hard fares the white waiter who waits upon cannibals. Not a napkin should he carry on his arm, but a buckler. In good time, though, to his great delight, the three salt sea warriors would rise and depart, to his credulous, fable-mongering ears, all their martial bones jingling in them at every step, like Moorish sumptars in scabbards. But, though these barbarians dined in the cabin, and nominally lived there, still, being anything but sedentary in their habits, they were scarcely ever in it except at mealtimes, and, just before sleeping time, when they passed through it to their own peculiar quarters. In this one matter, Ahab seemed no exception to most American whale captains, who, as a set, rather inclined to the opinion that by rights the ship's cabin belongs to them, and that it is by courtesy alone that anybody else is, at any time, permitted there. So that, in real truth, the mates and harpooners of the, Pequod might more properly be said to have lived out of the cabin than in it. For when they did enter it, it was something as a street door enters a house turning inwards for a moment, only to be turned out the next, and, as a permanent thing, residing in the open air. Nor did they lose much hereby, in the cabin was no companionship, socially, Ahab was inaccessible. Though nominally included in, the census of Christendom, he was still an alien to it. He lived in the world, as the last of the grizzly bears lived in settled Missouri. And as when spring and summer had departed, that wild Logan of the woods, burying himself in the hollow of a tree, lived out the winter there, sucking his own paws, so, in his inclement, howling old age, Ahab's soul, shut up in the cave trunk of his body, there, fed upon the solid
Chapter 35 The Masthead It was during the more pleasant weather, that in due rotation with the other seamen my first masthead came round. In most American whalemen the mastheads are manned almost simultaneously with the vessels leaving her port, even though she may have 15,000 miles, and more, to sail air reaching her proper cruising ground. And if, after a three, four, or five, years voyage she is drawing nigh home with anything empty in her, say, an empty vial even then, her mastheads are kept manned to the last, and not till her sky sail pulls sail in among the spires of the port, does she altogether relinquish the hope of capturing one whale more. Now, as the business of standing mastheads, ashore or afloat, is a very ancient and interesting one, let us in some, measure expatiate here. I take it, that the earliest standers of mastheads were the old Egyptians, because, in all my researches, I find none prior to them. For though their progenitors, the builders of Babel, must doubtless, by their tower, have intended to rear the loftiest masthead in all Asia, or Africa either, yet, ere the final truck was put to it, as that great stone mast of theirs may be said to have gone by the board, in the dread gale of God's wrath, therefore, we cannot give these Babel builders priority over the Egyptians. And that the Egyptians were a nation of masthead standers, is an assertion based upon the general belief among archaeologists, that the first pyramids were founded for astronomical purposes, a theory singularly supported by the peculiar stair-like formation, of all four sides of those edifices, whereby, with prodigious long upliftings of their legs, those old astronomers were wont to mount to the apex, and sing out for new stars, even as the lookouts of a modern ship sing out for a sail, or a whale just bearing in sight. In St. Stylites, the famous Christian hermit of old times, who built him a lofty stone pillar in the desert and spent the whole, latter portion of his life on its summit, hoisting his food from the ground with a tackle, in him we have a remarkable instance of a dauntless stander of mastheads, who was not to be driven from his place by fogs or frosts, rain, hail, or sleet, but valiantly facing everything out to the last, literally died at his post. Of modern standards of mastheads we have but a lifeless set, mere stone, iron, and bronze men, who, though well capable of facing out a stiff gale, are still entirely incompetent to the business of singing out upon discovering any strange sight. There is Napoleon, who, upon the top of the column of Vendome, stands with arms folded, some 150 feet in the air, careless, now, who rules the decks below, whether Louis Philippe, Louis Blank, or Louis the, Devil. Great Washington, too, stands high aloft on his towering mainmast in Baltimore, and like one of Hercules' pillars, his column marks that point of human grandeur beyond which few mortals will go. Admiral Nelson, also, on a capstan of gunmetal, stands his masthead in Trafalgar Square, and ever when most obscured by that London smoke, token is yet given that a hidden hero is there, for where? there is smoke, must be fire. But neither Great Washington, nor Napoleon, nor Nelson, will answer a single hail from below, however madly invoked to befriend by their counsels the distracted decks upon which they gaze, however it may be surmised, that their spirits penetrate through the thick haze of the future, and descry what shoals and what rocks must be shunned. It may seem unwarrantable to, couple in any respect the masthead standers of the land with those of the sea but that in truth it is not so, is plainly evinced by an item for which Obed Macy, the sole historian of Nantucket, stands accountable. The worthy Obed tells us, that in the early times of the whale fishery, airships were regularly launched in pursuit of the game, the people of that island erected lofty spars along, the sea coast, to which the lookouts ascended by means of nailed cleats, something as fowls go upstairs in a hen house. A few years ago this same plan was adopted by the Bay Whalemen of New Zealand, who, upon descrying the game, gave notice to the ready man boats nigh the beach. But this custom has now become obsolete, turn we then to the one proper masthead, that of a whale ship at sea. The, three mastheads are kept manned from sunrise to sunset, the seamen taking their regular turns, as at the helm, and relieving each other every two hours. In the serene weather of the tropics it is exceedingly pleasant the masthead, nay, to a dreamy meditative man it is delightful. 
There you stand, a hundred feet above the silent decks, striding along the deep, as if the masts were gigantic, stilts, while beneath you and between your legs, as it were, swim the hugest monsters of the sea, even as ships once sailed between the boots of the famous Colossus at Old Rhodes. There you stand, lost in the infinite series of the sea, with nothing ruffled but the waves. The tranced ship indolently rolls, the drowsy trade winds blow, everything resolves you into linger. For the most part, in, this tropic wailing life, a sublime uneventfulness invests you, you hear no news, read no gazettes, extras with startling accounts of commonplaces never delude you into unnecessary excitements, you hear of no domestic afflictions, bankrupt securities, fall of stocks, are never troubled with the thought of what you shall have for dinner, for all your meals for three years and more are snugly stowed, in casks, and your bill of fare is immutable. In one of those southern whalesmen, on a long three or four years voyage, as often happens, the sum of the various hours you spend at the masthead would amount to several entire months. And it is much to be deplored that the place to which you devote so considerable a portion of the whole term of your natural life, should be so sadly destitute of, anything approaching to a cozy inhabitiveness, or adapted to breed a comfortable localness of feeling, such as pertains to a bed, a hammock, a hearse, a sentry box, a pulpit, a coach, or any other of those small and snug contrivances in which men temporarily isolate themselves. Your most usual point of perch is the head of the tea gallant mast, where you stand upon two thin parallel sticks, almost, peculiar to whalemen, called the tea gallant cross trees. Here, tossed about by the sea, the beginner feels about as cozy as he would standing on a bull's horns. To be sure, in cold weather you may carry your house aloft with you, in the shape of a watch coat, but properly speaking the thickest watch coat is no more of a house than the unclad body, for as the soul is glued inside of its fleshy, tabernacle, and cannot freely move about in it, nor even move out of it, without running great risk of perishing, like an ignorant pilgrim crossing the snowy Alps in winter, so a watch coat is not so much of a house as it is a mere envelope, or additional skin encasing you. You cannot put a shelf or chest of drawers in your body, and no more can you make a convenient closet of your watch coat. Concerning all this, it is much to be deplored that the mastheads of a southern whale ship are unprovided with those enviable little tents or pulpits, called crow's nests, in which the lookouts of a Greenland whaler are protected from the inclement weather of the frozen seas. In the fireside narrative of Captain Sleet, entitled A Voyage Among the Icebergs, in quest of the Greenland whale, and, incidentally for the rediscovery of the lost Icelandic colonies of old Greenland, in this admirable volume, all standards of mastheads are furnished with a charmingly circumstantial account of the then recently invented crow's nest of the glacier, which was the name of Captain Sleet's good craft. He called it the Sleet's Crow's Nest, in honor of himself, he being the original inventor and, patentee, and free from all ridiculous false delicacy and holding that if we call our own children after our own names, we fathers being the original inventors and patentees, so likewise should we denominate after ourselves any other apparatus we may beget. In shape, the sleet's crow's nest is something like a large terrace or a pipe, it is open above, however, where it is furnished with a movable, side screen to keep to windward of your head in a hard gale. Being fixed on the summit of the mast, you ascend into it through a little trap hatch in the bottom. On the after side, or side next the stern of the ship, is a comfortable seat, with a locker underneath for umbrellas, comforters, and coats. In front is a leather rack, in which to keep your speaking trumpet, pipe, telescope, and other nautical conveniences. When Captain Sleet in person stood his masthead in this crow's nest of his, he tells us that he always had a rifle with him, also fixed in the rack together with a powder flask and shot, for the purpose of popping off the strain our whales, or vagrancy unicorns infesting those waters, for you cannot successfully shoot at them from the deck owing to the resistance of the, water, but to shoot down upon them is a very different thing, now, it was plainly a labor of love for Captain Sleet to describe, as he does, all the little detailed conveniences of his crow's nest, but though he so enlarges upon many of these, and though he treats us to a very scientific account of his experiments in this crow's nest, 
with a small compass he kept there for the purpose of counteracting the errors resulting from what is called the local attraction of albinical magnets, an error ascribable to the horizontal vicinity of the iron in the ship's planks, and in the glacier's case, perhaps, to there having been so many broken down blacksmiths among her crew, I say, that though the captain is very discreet and scientific here, yet, for all his learned binnacle deviations, azimuth compass observations, and approximate errors, he, knows very well, Captain Sleet, that he was not so much immersed in those profound magnetic meditations, as to fail being attracted occasionally towards that well-replenished little case bottle, so nicely tucked in on one side of his crow's nest, within easy reach of his hand. Though, upon the whole, I greatly admire and even love the brave, the honest, and learned captain, yet I take it very ill, of him that he should so utterly ignore that case bottle, seeing what a faithful friend and comforter it must have been, while with mittened fingers and hooded head he was studying the mathematics aloft there in that bird's nest within three or four perches of the pole. But if we southern whale fishers are not so snugly housed aloft as Captain Sleet and his Greenlandmen were, yet that disadvantage is greatly counterbalanced by the widely contrasting serenity of those seductive seas in which we South Fishers mostly float. For one, I used to lounge up the rigging very leisurely, resting in the top to have a chat with Gwigig, or anyone else off duty whom I might find there, then ascending a little way further, and throwing a lazy leg over the top sail yard, take a preliminary view of the, watery pastures, and so at last mount to my ultimate destination. Let me make a clean breast of it here, and frankly admit that I kept but sorry guard. With the problem of the universe revolving in me, how could I, being left completely to myself at such a thought engendering altitude how could I but lightly hold my obligations to observe all whale ships standing orders, keep your weather eye, open, and sing out every time. And let me in this place movingly admonish you, ye ship owners of Nantucket. Beware of enlisting in your vigilant fisheries any lad with lean brow and hollow eye, given to unseasonable meditativeness, and who offers to ship with a fed on instead of boatage in his head. Beware of such an one, I say, your whales must be seen before they can be killed, and this, sunken eyed young platonist will tow you ten wakes round the world, and never make you one pint of sperm the richer. Nor are these monitions at all unneeded. For nowadays, the whale fishery furnishes an asylum for many romantic, melancholy, and absent-minded young men, disgusted with the carking cares of earth, and seeking sentiment in tar and blubber. Child Harold not unfrequently perches, himself upon the masthead of some luckless disappointed whale ship, and in moody phrase ejaculates, Roll on, thou deep and dark blue ocean, roll. Ten thousand blubber hunters sweep over thee in vain. Very often do the captains of such ships take those absent-minded young philosophers to task, upbraiding them with not feeling sufficient interest in the voyage, half hinting that they are so, hopelessly lost to all honorable ambition, as that in their secret souls they would rather not see whales than otherwise. But all in vain, those young Platonists have a notion that their vision is imperfect, they are short-sighted, what use, then, to strain the visual nerve? they have left their opera glasses at home. Why, thou monkey, said a harpooner to one of these lads, we've been cruising, now hard upon three years, and thou hast not raised a whale yet. Whales are scarce as hen's teeth whenever thou art up here. Perhaps they were, or perhaps there might have been shoals of them in the far horizon, but lulled into such an opium-like listlessness of vacant. Unconscious reverie is this absent-minded youth by the blending cadence of waves with thoughts, that at last he loses his, identity, takes the mystic ocean at his feet for the visible image of that deep, blue, bottomless soul, pervading mankind and nature, and every strange, half-seen, gliding, beautiful thing that eludes him, every dimly discovered, uprising fin of some undiscernible form seems to him the embodiment of those elusive thoughts that only people the soul by continually flitting through it. In this, enchanted mood, thy spirit ebbs away to whence it came, becomes diffused through time and space, like Cranmer's sprinkled pantheistic ashes, forming at last a part of every shore the round globe over. There is no life in thee, now, except that rocking life imparted by a gently rolling ship, by her, borrowed from the sea, by the sea, 
from the inscrutable tides of God. But while this sleep, this, dream is on ye, move your foot or hand an inch, slip your hold at all, and your identity comes back in horror. Over these caution vortices you hover. And perhaps, at midday, in the fairest weather, with one half throttled shriek you drop through that transparent air into the summer sea, no more to rise forever. Heed it well, ye pay. Chapter 36. The Quarter Deck. Enter Ahab, then, all, it was not a great while after the affair of the pipe, that one morning shortly after breakfast, Ahab, as was his wont, ascended the cabin gangway to the deck. There most sea captains usually walk at that hour, as country gentlemen, after the same meal, take a few turns in the garden. Soon his study, ivory stride was heard, as to and fro he, paced his old rounds upon planks so familiar to his tread, that they were all over dinted, like geological stones, with the peculiar mark of his walk. Did you fixedly gaze, too, upon that ribbed and dented brow, there also, you would see still stranger footprints, the footprints of his one unsleeping, ever-pacing thought. But on the occasion in question, those dents looked deeper, even as his, nervous step that morning left a deeper mark. And, so full of his thought was Ahab, that at every uniform turn that he made, now at the mainmast and now at the binnacle, you could almost see that thought turn in him as he turned, and pace in him as he paced, so completely possessing him, indeed, that it all but seemed the inward mold of every outer movement. Do you mark him, flask? Whispered, stub, the chick that's in him pecks the shell. Twill soon be out. The hours wore on semicolon Ahab now shut up within his cabin, anon, pacing the deck, with the same intense bigotry of purpose in his aspect. It drew near the close of day. Suddenly he came to a halt by the bulwarks, and inserting his bone leg into the auger hole there, and with one hand grasping a shroud, he ordered Starbuck to send, everybody aft. Sir! said the mate astonished at an order seldom or never given on shipboard except in some extraordinary case. Send everybody aft, repeated Ahab. Mastheads, there. Come down. When the entire ship's company were assembled, and with curious and not wholly unapprehensive faces, were eyeing him, for he looked not unlike the weather horizon when a storm is coming up, Ahab, after rapidly glancing over the bulwarks, and then darting his eyes among the crew started from his standpoint, and as though not a soul were nigh him resumed his heavy turns upon the deck. With bent head and half-slouched hat he continued to pace, unmindful of the wondering whispering among the men, till Stubb cautiously whispered to Flask, that Ahab must have summoned them there for the purpose, of witnessing a pedestrian feat. But this did not last long. Vehemently pausing, he cried, What do ye do when ye see a whale, men? Sing out for him was the impulsive rejoinder from a score of clubbed voices. Good! cried Ahab, with a wild approval in his tones, observing the hearty animation into which his unexpected question had so magnetically thrown them. And what do ye next, men, lower away, and after him? And what tune is it ye pull to, men? A dead whale or a stove boat? More and more strangely and fiercely glad and approving? grew the countenance of the old man at every shout, while the mariners began to gaze curiously at each other, as if marveling how it was that they themselves became so excited at such seemingly purposeless questions. But, they were all, eagerness again, as Ahab, now half revolving in his pivot hole, with one hand reaching high up a shroud, and tightly, almost convulsively grasping it, addressed them thus. All ye mastheaders have before now heard me give orders about a white whale. Look ye! Do ye see this Spanish ounce of gold? Holding up a broad bright coin to the sun, it is a sixteen dollar piece, men. Do ye see it? Mr. Starbuck, hand me yon top maul. While the maid was getting the hammer, Ahab, without speaking, was slowly rubbing the gold piece against the skirts of his jacket, as if to heighten its luster and without using any words was meanwhile lowly humming to himself, producing a sound so strangely muffled and inarticulate that it seemed the mechanical humming of the wheels of his vitality in him, receiving the top maul from Starbuck, 
he advanced towards the mainmast with a hammer uplifted in one hand, exhibiting the gold with the other, and with a high raised voice exclaiming, Whosoever of ye raises me a white headed whale with a wrinkled brow and a crooked jaw, whosoever of ye raises me that white headed whale, with three holes punctured in his starboard fluke, look ye, whosoever of ye, raises me that same white whale, he shall have this gold ounce, my boys. Huzza! Huzza! cried the seamen, as with swinging tarpaulins they hailed the act of nailing the gold to the mast. It's a white whale, I say, resumed Ahab, as he threw down the top maul, a white whale. Skin your eyes for him, men, look sharp for white water, if ye see but a bubble, sing out. All this while Tashko, Dagu, and Queekick had looked on with even more intense interest and surprise than the rest and at the mention of the wrinkled brow and crooked jaw they had started as if each was separately touched by some specific recollection. Captain Ahab, said Tashko, that white whale must be the same that some call Moby Dick. Moby Dick? shouted Ahab. Do ye know the white whale then, Tash? Does, he fantail a little curious, sir, before he goes down? said the gay header deliberately. And has he a curious spout, too, said Dagu. Very bushy, even for a pa or a masetti, and mighty quick, Captain Ahab. And he have one, two, three, oh. Good many iron in him hide, too, Captain, cried Gweekab disjointedly, all twisty beat twisk, like him him, faltering hard for a word, and screwing his, hand round and round as though uncorking a bottle, like him, him, corkscrew. Cried Ahab, I, Gweekab. The harpoons lie all twisted and wrenched in him, I, Dagu, his spout is a big one, like a whole shock of wheat, and white as a pile of our Nantucket will after the great annual sheep shearing, I, Tashko, and he fantails like a split jib in a squall. Death and devils. Men, it is Moby, Dick ye have seen, Moby Dick Moby Dick. Captain Ahab, said Starbuck, who, with stub and flask had thus far been eyeing his superior with increasing surprise, but at last seemed struck with a thought which somewhat explained all the wonder. Captain Ahab, I have heard of Moby Dick, but it was not Moby Dick that took off thy leg. Who told thee that? cried Ahab, then pausing, I, Starbuck, I, my hearties all round, it was Moby Dick that dismasted me, Moby Dick that brought me to this dead stump I stand on now. I, I. He shouted with a terrific, loud, animal sob, like that of a heart-stricken moose, I, I. It was that accursed white whale that traced me, made a poor pegging lubber of me forever and a day. Then tossing both arms, with measureless imprecations he shouted, out, I, I. And I'll chase him round Good Hope, and round the Horn, and round the Norway Maelstrom, and round Perdition's flames before I give him up. And this is what ye have shipped for men. To chase that white whale on both sides of land, and over all sides of earth, till he spouts black blood and rolls fin out. What say ye, men, will ye splice hands on it, now? I think ye do look brave, I, I, shouted the harpooners and seamen, running closer to the excited old man, a sharp eye for the white whale, a sharp lance for Moby Dick. God bless ye, he seemed to half sob and half shout. God bless ye, men. Steward. Go draw the great measure of grog. But what's this long face about, Mr. Starbuck, wilt thou not chase the white whale? Art not game for Moby Dick? I am game for his, crooked jaw, and for the jaws of death too, Captain Ahab, if it fairly comes in the way of the business we follow, but I came here to hunt whales, not my commander's vengeance. How many barrels will thy vengeance yield thee even if thou gettest it? Captain Ahab. It will not fetch thee much in our Nantucket market. Nantucket market. Hoot. But come closer, Starbuck, thou requirest a little lower, layer. If money's to be the measurer, man, and the accountants have computed their great counting house the globe, by girdling it with guineas, one to every three parts of an inch, then, let me tell thee, that my vengeance will fetch a great premium here. He smites his chest. Whispered Stubb, what's that for? Methinks it rings most vast, but hollow. Vengeance on a dumb brute! cried, Starbuck, 
that simply smote thee from blindest instinct. Madness. To be enraged with a dumb thing, Captain Ahab, seems blasphemous. Hark ye yet again, the little lower layer. All visible objects, man, are but as pasteboard masks. But in each event, in the living act, the undoubted deed, there, some unknown but still reasoning thing puts forth the moldings of its features from behind the, unreasoning mask. If man will strike, strike through the mask. How can the prisoner reach outside except by thrusting through the wall? To me, the white whale is that wall, shoved near to me. Sometimes I think there's naught beyond. But tis enough. He tasks me, he heaps me, I see in him outrageous strength, with an inscrutable malice signing it. That inscrutable thing is chiefly what I hate, and, be the white whale agent, or be the white whale principal, I will wreak that hate upon him. Talk not to me of blasphemy, man, I'd strike the sun if it insulted me. For could the sun do that, then could I do the other, since there is ever a sort of fair play herein, jealousy presiding over all creations. But not my master, man, is even that fair play. Who's over me? Truth hath no confines. Take off, thine eye. More intolerable than fiend's glarings is adultish stare. So, so, thou redness and palest, my heat has melted thee to anger glow. But look ye, Starbuck, what is said in heat, that thing unsays itself. There are men from whom warm words are small indignity. I meant not to incense thee. Let it go. Look. See yonder Turkish cheeks of spotted taunt, living, breathing pictures painted by the, sun, the pagan leopards, the unrecking and unworshipping things, that live, and seek, and give no reasons for the toward life they feel. The crew, man, the crew. Are they not one and all with Ahab, in this matter of the whale? See Stubb. He laughs. See yonder Chilean. He snorts to think of it. Stand up amid the general hurricane, thy one tossed sapling cannot, Starbuck. And what is it? Reckon it. Tis but, to help strike a fin, no wonder's feet for Starbuck. What is it more? From this one poor hunt, then, the best lance out of all Nantucket, surely he will not hang back, when every foremost hand has clutched a whetstone. Ah! Constrainings seize thee, I see. The billow lifts thee. Speak, but speak exclamation mark I, I. Thy silence, then, that voice is thee. Aside, something shot from my dilated nostrils, he has, inhaled it in his lungs. Starbuck now is mine, cannot oppose me now, without rebellion. God keep me exclamation mark keep us all. Murmured Starbuck, lowly. But in his joy at the enchanted, tacit acquiescence of the mate, Ahab did not hear his foreboding invocation, nor yet the low laugh from the hold, nor yet the presaging vibrations of the winds in the cortege nor yet the hollow flap of the sails against the, masts, as for a moment their hearts sank in. For again Starbuck's downcast eyes lighted up with the stubbornness of life, the subterranean laugh died away, the winds blew on, the sails filled out, the ship heaved and rolled as before. Ah, ye admonitions and warnings! Why stay ye not when ye come? But rather are ye predictions than warnings, ye shadows! yet not so much predictions from without, as, verifications of the foregoing things within. For with little external to constrain us, the innermost necessities in our being, these still drive us on. The measure. The measure. Cried Ahab. Receiving the brimming pewter, and turning to the harpooners, he ordered them to produce their weapons. Then ranging them before him near the capstan, with their harpoons in their hands while his three mates stood at his side with their lances, and the rest of the ship's company formed a circle round the group, he stood for an instant searchingly eyeing every man of his crew. But those wild eyes met his, as the bloodshot eyes of the prairie wolves meet the eye of their leader, ere he rushes on at their head in the trail of the bison, but, alas! only to fall into the hidden snare of the Indian, drink and pass. He cried, handing the heavy charged flag into the nearest seaman. The crew alone now drink. Round with it, round. Short draughts, long swallows, men, tis hot as Satan's hoof. So, so, it goes round excellently. It spiralizes in ye, 
forks at at the serpent's snapping eye. Well done, almost drained. That way it went, this way it comes. Hand it me, here's a hollow. Men, ye seem the, years, so brimming life is gulped and gone. Steward, refill. Attend now, my braves. I have mustered ye all round this capstan, and ye mates, flank me with your lances, and ye harpooners, stand there with your irons, and ye, stout mariners, ring me in, that I may in some sort revive a noble custom of my fishermen fathers before me. O men, you will yet see that, ha! Huh? Boy, come back? Bad pennies come, not sooner. Hand it me. Why, now, this pewter had run brimming again. Wert not thou street vitus imp, away, thou ague. Advance, ye mates. Cross your lances full before me. Well done. Let me touch the axis. So saying, with extended arm, he grasped the three level, radiating lances at their cross center, while so doing, suddenly and nervously twitched them, meanwhile, glancing intently from, starbuck to stub, from stub to flask. It seemed as though, by some nameless, interior volition, he would fain have shocked into them the same fiery emotion accumulated within the leaden jar of his own magnetic life. The three mates quailed before his strong, sustained, and mystic aspect. Stubb and Flask looked sideways from him, the honest eye of Starbuck fell downright. In vain! cried Ahab, but, maybe, tis well. For did ye three but once take the full forced shock, then mine own electric thing, that had perhaps expired from out me. Perchance, too, it would have dropped ye dead. Perchance ye need it not. Down lances. And now, ye mates, I do appoint ye three coverers to my three pagan kinsmen there, yon three most honorable gentlemen and noblemen, my valiant harpooners. Disdain the, task? What, when the great Pope washes the feet of beggars, using his tiara for your? Oh! My sweet cardinals! Your own condescension, that shall bend ye to it. I do not order ye, ye will it. Cut your seizings and draw the poles, ye harpooners. Silently obeying the order, the three harpooners now stood with the detached iron part of their harpoons, some three feet long, held, barbs up, before, him. Stab me not with that keen steel. Can't them, can't them over. Know ye not the goblet end? Turn up the socket. So, so, now, ye cupbearers, advance. The irons. Take them, hold them while I fill. Forthwith, slowly going from one officer to the other, he brimmed the harpoon sockets with the fiery waters from the pewter. Now, three to three, ye stand. Commend the murderous chalices. Bestow, them, ye who are now made parties to this indissoluble league. Ha! Starbuck. But the deed is done. Yon ratifying sun now waits to sit upon it. Drink, ye harpooners. Drink and swear, ye men that man the deathful whaleboat's bow, death to Moby Dick. God hunt us all, if we do not hunt Moby Dick to his death. The long, barbed steel goblets were lifted, and to cries and maledictions against the white, whale, the spirits were simultaneously quaffed down with a hiss. Starbuck paled, and turned, and shivered. Once more, and finally, the replenished pewter went the rounds among the frantic crew, when, waving his free hand to them, they all dispersed, and Ahab retired within his